Okay, it should be going. Was that Shelly's cat? Yay, cat. Oh, love it. <laughs> the, the picture on the screen is making me feel itchy just seeing it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, hi, folks. Um, and Nikki, let me know if you can't hear me or if I'm starting to get quiet or too mumbly, okay? Um, sure. I care a lot about symptom management, as you will see. Um, I'm planning on eventually becoming a palliative care doc. Um, and I just think symptoms are an underappreciated part of what we do in medicine or managing symptoms rather. Um, so I'm gonna be mostly talking about itching with also some tidbits with other um, uh, symptoms, namely dry mouth and also air hunger right at the end. If we run out of time though, this might just be an itching talk. We'll see how verbose I become. Um, so, oh my gosh, there we go. Um, I want you to understand why non-pain symptom management, we're pretty good at managing pain, we do it every day in the hospital and in clinic. So I wanna focus on non-pain symptom management, um, like why it matters, um, review some mechanisms of common symptoms, um, we will mostly be talking about the mechanism of um, itching, however, and then identify some tools to manage common non-pain symptoms. And that'll be the main focus for all three of the um, symptoms I'll talk about. Um, like I said, I'm gonna be touching on chronic itch, no pun intended, and um, dry mouth as well as air hunger. Um, for chronic itch, Specifically, I want to just get, and it's a little bit, I might adjust my screen to gallery, show grid view, perfect. Um, if you could just use the like raise hand function, I think we all have that, um, to raise your hand, or you can also just literally raise your hand. Um, if you have a patient currently in clinic um, who's really itchy, or if you've had a patient on the wards in the past you know, year, six months. That's really itchy and you like don't know what to do about it. Love these hands, amazing, yes. I mean, I don't love the hands. It means a lot of people are itchy. A lot of people are super itchy. Um, speaking of itchy, try to pay attention to whether or not you've already itched yourself during this talk. I have. Okay, um, you have a patient with chronic itching and then have you itched in the past three minutes? I already see some head nods. Um, okay, so thanks for all the hands, folks. Um, why do we care about itching? I think, and this is part of what motivated me to do this talk as a medical student and as a, a resident even, there are times when I bring up symptom management on rounds and people just like have their eyes glazed over and just like, or like, can we talk about diuresis, please? Like. I don't want to talk about itching. Um, I care more about itching than diuresis, to be honest. Um, so I just hope to impart some of my passion for symptom management upon you. Um, first, itching is miserable. Totally, totally miserable. Um, there are actually studies that have demonstrated and like compared the, the misery of various ailments. And folks who are chronically itchy have a comparable health quality of life to those um, being treated for stroke or with a history of stroke, which was kind of surprising to me. Um, we also just know, and I one example I use is like folks who have um, uh, like delusional parasitosis have a lot of like skin breakdown from like incredible excoriations everywhere. Um, and any skin breakdown increases risk for infection. So if you care less about patient experience and more just about treating infection, even itching is important. Itching should still be important to you rather. Um, and then also a ton of people will experience chronic itching in their life. Like a quarter of people, not just like someone experiencing itching because they ate some peanuts and got hives and are itchy, like chronic itching. So pretty prominent. Um, as I was kind of studying this uh, 
topic for this talk. Um, I learned that one of the circles of hell involves itching in Dante's Inferno. I will not read this to you, um, but this is only to say that itchiness is hellish. Um, and then we often, I think as we progress from like medical student to, to resident, and I'm talking mostly for myself, like the pathophys kind of falls by the wayside and management and like practical clinical medicine starts to rise to the top of the priority. But I want to just bring us back to the mechanism of itching because, um, first of all, I had, I didn't really know the mechanism. Second of all, we have so many patients who are itchy. Um, and it's really hard when we don't know how to explain um, what itching is to explain to a patient that we like believe and acknowledge that their itchiness is real, even when we don't know why they're itchy. Um, and there are some guidelines actually from um, a couple countries in Europe that basically emphasize that when we don't know the etiology of a disease or symptom rather, um, having an explanation that makes sense to a patient can be really validating. Um, and part of having that explanation is understanding at least a little bit about the mechanism. So we will touch on the mechanism. Um, this is a busy slide. I promise you, I will not talk about all these little dots and like every arrow, but I do think it's important, as I mentioned, to kind of have a brief and like, uh, at least a little bit of a whiff of understanding of the mechanism so that you can explain to patients like what itching is, um, but also explain um, why there are like, or think about um, different treatments that relate to the different um, components of this mechanism. Um, so there's histaminergic and non-histaminergic neural pathways that like mediate the, the itching um, feeling. Um, histaminergic involving histamine tends to be more, um, acute. And then the non-histaminergic pathway involves, um, a ton of puritogens, a word I did not know before this talk, um, things that make us itchy. Um, unsurprisingly, these neural pathways, um, uh, respond to, um, puritogens in the periphery, um, and eventually those signals, um, approach the spinal cord, ascend up the spinal thalamic tract, end up um, being processed in the brain through the thalamus, and then we get the sensation of being itchy. Um, there are a few important points I think about itching, um, specifically the itching mechanism that are important. Um, one is that there are both um, there's a lot of overlap between the pain neurons and the itching neurons. Um, the type of neurons are not things you need to remember, but only to say that there is some overlap. And this is important because some of the treatment modalities that you will see um, have some overlap with pain management, which is kind of interesting. Um, there are tons and tons and tons of skin pyridogens involved in the sort of cascade of, of itching signaling. Um, do not remember these cytokines. This is only to say that it's very much immune modulated and very much um, related to um, especially um, T cells and some um, cytokines released by the T cells. Um, again, this is important because there are um, treatment modalities that target these specific cytokines for folks who have really severe itching. Um, one theme I would like to um, impart upon you um, is that there are increased mu opioid receptor activity and decreased kaba opioid receptor activity in folks who are particularly itchy. And I'll reiterate this a few times. This is important. Again, there are meds that target these um, different mechanisms. Um, I want to emphasize that I'm not going to be talking about like 
workup of itching or um, all of the different like differential diagnosis for someone. This is not what this talk is for. Um, I'm gonna be talking specifically about treating itching in hepatobiliary disease, chronic kidney disease, and then kind of like a general, I don't know what to do um, when somebody's really itchy. Um, I'm wondering again, maybe with hand, either the physical hand raised if your video is on or the little like icon -y, um hand raise. If you have a patient who has hepatobiliary disease, liver disease, um, who's been like really itchy and you don't know what to do about it chronically or acutely. I see some thumbs up. I see more hands. I see hands. Love it. Love it. Super common. This was actually, I was inspired to like focus on this topic first was because I had a, a patient as a medical student who was about my age and like dying of liver failure. Um, and it was super itchy and I was just determined to help him not be itchy before he died. And I was unfortunately not very successful. Um, turns out sarna lotion is not the magic bullet. Um, okay. Um, so hepatobiliary disease, there are a bunch of mechanisms that um, are interrelated when it comes to etching in, in liver disease. Um, I think the teaching that I got was like, oh, the bilirubin is irritating and it makes you itchy, the end, which is in part true, um, but it's way more complicated than that, unfortunately, um, and unsurprisingly, I guess, like everything in medicine. Um, there are bile salts, as we know, um, that build up in hepatobiliary disease leading to mast cell degranulation, histamine release, and then we think about that histaminergic pathway for itching. Um, there's also some thought that the bile salts themselves lead to like um, kind of breakdown of hepatocytes. They're really irritating to the, on a cellular level and the leakage of those cellular contents um, basically means leakage of other puritogens leading to more itching. So not just histamine. Um, there's some evidence that autotoxin, you don't need to remember this or know what it is, only to say there's another substance, hand wavy, um, that correlates with puritis. Um, this is a drug target, which is why I mention it. Um, there's also endogenous opioids that act on these opioid receptors that I mentioned before, the kappa opioid receptor and the mu opioid receptor. There are drug targets for these. Um, and then there's also been some evidence that serotonin is associated with itching. So you will see also that there are some um, medications that target serotonin uh, to help with itching. Here is a, um, a um, flow chart that I modified a little bit um, from a paper that just talks about um, the kind of progression of um, drugs that we use to help with, with itching and the, the recommended sort of methods. Um, I'm gonna focus on medications and not sort of talk about transplant the way you see at the bottom of this flowchart, um, which would obviously be helpful. Um, the standard recommendation that I've seen basically everywhere is cholesteramine. It's like a, to help with the bile acids, not shown to be helpful unfortunately, but it's like the first thing that we use and it's the first recommendation and like all of the, the resources I, I found, including this. Um, it's safe. So I think that's part of the reason. Um, rifampicin is second line. And this um, has been shown to reduce autotoxin levels, which is um, that molecule I mentioned before that was associated with itching. Um, unfortunately, this is something that would, if you give a patient this med, you would need to, um, monitor liver enzymes because it's hepatotoxic, if not watched closely. Um, have any of you used rifampicin for a patient? Hand raise. I have never used it to be entirely honest. I see a lot of head nods. No, yeah, I haven't either. Um, and the point I make here is that there are other drugs that exist and also um, that there's 
I think what we do in practice varies a lot from what um, the evidence maybe supports. Speaking of evidence, there is some um, evidence to support the mu opioid receptor antagonists and kappa opioid receptor agonists um, as a third line for folks with severe itching. This would really be like a phone a friend, don't try this on your own kind of situation. Probably same with rifampicin since we don't use it much. Um, but it is like consistently recommended as a, a third line approach. I will talk about the evidence in a moment. Um, <clears throat> and lastly, SSRIs are something that are considered potentially helpful. As we know, SSRIs take a long time to work um, and would probably be more helpful in an outpatient setting and its utility is probably not, not uh, as great as we would hope. Um, so here's a busy slide, no need to memorize this. I just want to emphasize to you that one, there are really recent ongoing like randomized controlled trials for some of these meds. Um, and two, that one of the first line agents that we use, cholesteramine, we use first line, I think because it's safe. These studies are with 10 patients from like the 1960s to 1980s. The most recent study that I found like looking at it and referenced in these guidelines um, was from the 1980s. And no hit against the 1980s. This, being in the 1980s does not mean you have a bad study. It, they were just really small and didn't really show much benefit. So that was unfortunate. Um, rifampicin has been shown to be helpful. And then for the mu opioid antagonist, drugs we use all the time, naltrexone and naloxone, um, there are some fairly old, like 20 years-ish, um, randomized controlled trials with fairly small sample sizes that did show some benefit. These were all in inpatient. So in terms of using naltrexone as an outpatient doc might be um, probably challenging. From my memory, the naloxone one specifically is the one I'm thinking about. And that was like a naloxone infusion. So you'd really be at like the end of your kind of tools in your tool belt. Um, for the kappa opioid agonist, now furifine is one that's been studied quite recently. I had never heard of this medicine. And in part that's because it's not available in the US. Um, but there is a really quite large randomized controlled trial. Um, it, I think this one was done um, in China, if I'm remembering correctly. This drug is approved in Japan and one of like, from what I understand from my reading, um, I can't speak anecdotally, um, it's one of like the first line meds or recommended meds that are used for um, hepatobiliary related puritis. Um, it's not available here. It's also not available in Europe. Um, so I bring it up only to say there are other like drugs in the pipeline. Um, that are used. There is another kappa opioid agonist that's been shown to be helpful at the level of case series, case study. And this drug I believe is available in the US. I have never seen it used to be honest. Um, and then lastly, um, some antidepressants. There is a randomized control trial, very small. Um, and then another, um, small study um, comparing it to rifampicin, showing that sertraline is equally helpful as recently as 2019. Mm -hmm. um, so sertraline could be an interesting option. Patients often have comorbid conditions, so something to consider. Um, there's some thought that mirtazapine might be helpful, but as you can see, it's like case series level. Big picture, cholesteramine is first line, not often. Uh, found to be particularly helpful, but it's fairly safe compared to these other options. I do wanna call out one thing that you might be like, why aren't we talking about antihistamines? Not helpful in liver disease. I think we use it sometimes because it's safer maybe than some of these other options, but not helpful, not in the recommendations. 
Um, so what is the first line for hepatobiliary puritis slash itching? You can put it in the chat or you can say it out loud either way. And Nikki, if you see chat things, if you could shout them out. All we have so far is John Cho saying, wait, I'm from the 1980s. <laughs> um, sorry I, I'm, I'm defensive about the 80s i try to backtrack and say you know 80s does not equal old study it just is like where's where's the update um all we have lots of answers for cholestyramine for first line for biliary right. hepatobiliary right. pruritus great and then the second question is which of the following is a class of medicines used to treat hepatobiliary itching a antipsychotics b mu opioid receptor antagonists kappa opioid receptor agonists antihistamines the key here being hepatobiliary puritis and a better way to ask this question might be should be used not are used b and c is the overwhelming winner woohoo thanks folks um yeah b and c great job um questions about hepatobiliary puritis okay um we are launching over to chronic kidney disease um itching and kidney disease extremely prevalent um Tons of studies all over the world. There was one in the US that showed um, like 30% of those with uh, like severe kidney disease were very bothered by itching. Um, there are tons of um, components to the pathophysiology of itching in, um, in a kidney disease. I'm curious what y'all have been told. I know what I've been told and it didn't totally align with what I found. Um, you can throw it in the chat or say it out loud. What is the like teaching you've gotten on why people are itchy with kidney disease? Kayla says decreased clearance of toxins. Carrie says urea. Kristen says phosphorus. Shelly says BUN. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sounds yeah. like lots of uh, hand wavy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Um, that's what I've been told too. I've been told like urea is irritating. End of story. Um, which I don't think is wrong. Um, but similarly to um the itching mechanism, much more complicated than that. Um, and it's helpful to know that it's more complicated than that because it changes our drug targets. Um, and helps us explain to patients like what is going on and can validate some other symptoms. Um, so first, um, inflammation, like every disease process is very much involved. Um, there is heavy association with IL-31, which is a drug target. Um, one interesting piece is that a lot of folks have dry skin and kidney disease. And I read a variety of, of reasons for this. One is like, thinking about the fluid shifts in dialysis um, and some like restructuring of the, the skin in relation to the inflammation, thinking about the skin as like the biggest immune organ that we have, um, restructuring the skin for that reason. And then also these fluid shifts can kind of change um, the, the moisture of the skin. Um, so that's a big component. Um, Kristen said, um, phosphate. Yeah. So the calcium phosphate deposits in the skin are super puritogenic. Um, and then there's also some opioid receptor um, dysregulation in kidney disease as well. Why that is, I have no idea, to be honest with you. Um, but again, just important to note this because it changes what kind of um, treatments we're thinking about. Um, so as you can see in this, um, little image on the right um, in puritis, and I wouldn't call it uremic puritis. You'll notice that it's very common to call this uremic puritis. It's not just from uremia. Um, starting with topical anesthetics is a common approach. 
and then moving toward um, gabapentinoids and opioid modulators as you move up the severity and um, refractoriness of your itching. Um, this is, if you take anything away from the itching and kidney disease, I want you to remember that gabapentin is found to be the most helpful, like again and again. And my first thought was like, oh my gosh, I don't use gabapentin when people have kidney disease because it's gabapentin. We can't use gabapentin or we shouldn't use gabapentin. Um, but this review from 2017 showed that of 44 randomized controlled trials, literally only gabapentin had sufficient evidence to be used. We have other options that are safer potentially, but in terms of utility, gabapentin. Um, I love up to date. I use it all the time. In this case, they will tell you to use antihistamines first, or at least as one of the first options. They really don't work well. And this is just a reminder. reminder. Um, John Cho, you might've been uh, the person who taught me this. I don't remember. Uh, someone did. Uh, that up to date is like expert opinion and not necessarily like evidence based. It's like anecdote expert, which has value and we use it all the time. Um, but this is just a reminder that up to date is not equal to evidence. Um, so gabapentinoids, gabapentin and pregabalin shown to be very helpful. There's a Cochrane review from 2020 that emphasizes this as well. Um, there are some topical anesthetics that are really helpful, small sample sizes, but we have randomized control trials for them, which surprised me. Um, Promoxine and capsaicin um, have been shown to be helpful. Um, and again, this now furafine um, for a, a kappa opioid agonist is that drug that I mentioned before that's not available in the US. Um, there, um, is a randomized controlled trial specifically looking at its use in kidney disease found to be helpful, 2023. So this is still like a very active um, area of research. I want to mention one med, lastly, that I cannot pronounce. I wrote its brand name because I can pronounce that easier, Corsuva. Um, there was a randomized controlled trial from 2020 that showed that this drug was quite helpful. My understanding is that this drug is available in the US. Um, uh, we checked to see if it was available it, like on Epic, if we tried to order it, could not find it. Um, but I think it would be worth asking pharmacy or asking your nephrology colleagues if, um, if you're really kind of in a bind and somebody's really suffering. Um, thinking about if you can get this sort of um, as a non-formulary, um, something to think about. Questions about kidney disease, itching? Nikki, anything in the chat that I'm missing? Nope. Sweet. Okay, um, lastly, medically unexplained itching. Um, I'm gonna bring back this uh, kind of very busy image to just show you um, where some of the, the treatments overlap with the mechanism. Um, there are tons and tons and tons of medications that target these wide variety of um, immune uh, like cytokines, target a bunch of cytokines. I have never seen a biologic used for itching. I just want you to know that they exist and that like these components of puritis um, are being looked at in terms of like drug development. Um, there's some talk that cannabinoids topically could be helpful. I didn't see like convincing evidence, but in terms of safety, probably a bit better than some other options. Um, emollients are like really commonly recommended. Um, topical anesthetics. So like thinking about not only that um, skin barrier for the emollient option, but also the like nerve, peripheral nerves, um, topical anesthetics like topical lidocaine. Not something you can probably rub on your entire body, but can be helpful. Um, cooling agents can help um, 
the nerves calm down as well. People also use Botox occasionally. I haven't seen that used in practice, but it is an option. Um, talked about antihistamines, not shown to be particularly helpful for a lot of itching, but can be fairly low risk asterisks like beers criteria. Um, and then also antidepressants and gabapentinoids can be helpful in some situations. Um, let's see, let's see the first line for medically unexplained itching, meaning you've like done your due diligence and you're still kind of at a loss are really for gabapentinoids and SSRIs. Um, just not terribly surprising. Um, but just something to know. Um, so in summary for itching, um, itching is very much worth treating. It affects the like skin integrity. It affects folks quality of life. Um, and then the other, if you take away anything, like just know that itching matters. And also there are still drugs in the pipeline. Um, that may be coming up. If I hear any rumblings of something being acquired on the formulary, I will somehow let you all know. Um, so keep keep your eyes and ears open for that. Here's just a, a nice table that I found in case you want it later uh, for your reference, just looking at the different components of um, itching treatments. Um, so I've completed itching. Questions, comments about itching? Tinny, uh, Tinny shared that the drug whose name we cannot pronounce, Difelicphalin, is yes. in phase three trials and offer HD patients. So will likely be more common once data comes out. Amazing. Thank you, Tinny. Love that. I'm excited. When I chose this topic, I was like, oh my gosh, everything is going to be like, I don't know, not very new and nothing new will be happening because it's just itching but like there's a lot happening so stay tuned okay dry mouth um similar thing how many of you either personally have dry mouth or have a patient with dry mouth and have struggled to manage it this happened to me like literally yesterday two days ago in clinic felt really bad a lot of like head and neck cancer situation radiation related dry mouth, had a patient with Sjogren's. Um, curious, if you can throw in the chat, what are some options that you give patients? Like what do you prescribe patients who have dry mouth other than de-prescribing antihistamines? So not de-prescribing, let's say you have to prescribe something. What do you use? If anything, if you have no idea, just say you have no idea. We have some chat answers, biotin, lozenges, yeah. dental rinses. Yeah. No idea. Great. Yay. Thank you, the no idea person um, and everyone for responding. Um, okay. First, like, why do we care? Um, if any of you have had dry mouth, you know why we care because it really sucks for lack of a better description. Um, it's super, super prevalent in our older populations and in folks who have a lot of meds, which is kind of interesting. Um, there's a study in Sweden um, that showed with people who have more than five meds, like three quarters of them almost have dry mouth. Um, and in their study of the 300 plus people that they, um, they asked to be part of the study, um, 43% had dry mouth in the past six months. So very, very common. Um, affects quality of life in a big way. This goes without saying. Here's one piece that's kind of interesting to like medicalize this a little bit more. Um, when your mouth is dry, the pH changes. Don't ask me why. I don't know the answer to that. Um, it can lead to like bacterial dysregulation and bacterial overgrowth which can really affect um, your oral health and like can lead to dental caries. So just anecdotally and based on what I've read as well, um, folks who are gonna go undergo like radiation for um, 
head and neck uh, cancers often need like intense oral hygiene regimens, but also like a dental evaluation because people end up with like really significant um, dental issues when they have dry mouth. Um, oh, also I forgot to mention, I found little cacti from artists in Seattle. So if you're in need of a small cactus, hit up Maria or Mariah. I don't know how to say her name. Um, here is some paper art from a woman in Bellingham. She's delightful. I've talked to her before. Uh, she makes little cacti and other flowers out of paper. It's very nice. Okay, dry mouth management. Hydration is one thing that you'll see recommended, um, both um, orally and otherwise. Um, I honestly did not find much evidence that that was helpful, but you can imagine that if you uh, were not drinking water, your mouth would be dry. So logically makes sense. Um, and before I continue, I want to point out that there is a difference between um, dry, like the sensation of dry mouth and like actually not being able to produce saliva. Those are two kind of like, it's like a branch point. Um, in part because if you use a stimulant for saliva, but somebody has a literally just like shot parotid gland, they're not gonna produce saliva. Um, so it's important to kind of think about like why your patient has dry mouth before you think about what could be helpful. Um, so for this, um, first, and some examples of stimulants, people use um, ascorbic acid, malic acid, chewing gum, sour candy, preferably without sugar in it. Um, going back to that dental caries problem with dry mouth, wouldn't want to like give some extra food to the bacteria that are overgrowing in there. Um, there are other meds that are FDA approved for dry mouth, pilocarpine um, and Sevemiline, can't pronounce it. These are both um, FDA approved. We have given, or I have given, with the recommendation of my incredible intern at um, Harborview Wards, we gave a patient who had Sjogren's pilocarpine. Wasn't particularly helpful. That's not to say that it hasn't been shown to be helpful because it has, um, but I can say I have prescribed it once. Um, other options are some substitutes and people mentioned in the chat, um, like the biotin gel, that's like a um, salivary substitute. Um, you don't have to remember any of these like fancy long names or a bunch of brand names like biotin is a popular one. Um, but the main ingredient, mucin, has been shown to be the most helpful for folks. So you can keep your eyes peeled for that when you're prescribing. Um, in terms of management, and my apologies for this kind of unappealing uh, picture, um, but I think it's important. Um, a lot of the studies studying dry mouth use this like oral dry mouth score, um, scoring one being like minimally dry and then score four being very dry. You can see that tongue is like pretty cracked. And so when I talk about point decrease, I'm talking about these, like a scoring a uh, score of four versus three. Um, there was a randomized control trial in 2022 that showed that this combination of vitamin C spray, so ascorbic acid, um, and this peppermint water mount rinse, which sounds delightful, even if you don't have dry mouth, um, and lip moisturizer dropped patients a point, which they found to be not clinically significant. So kind of unfortunate. Um, there are some other trials as well, looking at different um, different meds, including um, saliva gel, like that biotin gel. Um, and there's a study from 2019 that showed this edible oral moisturizing jelly is more helpful. As far as I could tell, we don't have it or it doesn't exist. And please correct to me someone if you have seen or heard otherwise. But basically they found that if you can like consume it and swallow it in a way that you can with your normal saliva, people tend to do better. Um, the last Cochrane review about dry mouth was in 2011 and it was like not particularly um, groundbreaking. Um, it did 
point out though that this oxygenated glycerol triester spray or OGT spray um, is more helpful than water-based electrolyte spray. And I found that this drug as of this year was becoming like newly available, Aquarel. Um, it's like a new brand name. I think 3M, like the people who make your tape, uh, were making this drug before and you had to like get it through your dentist. Um, and now I think we might be able to order it too. I never have. I just found out about this. But it's $83 a month, which is kind of bonkers for a dry mouth. Um, less expensive than dealing with cavities if you actually are avoiding the complications of dry mouth. And also, like, if you're that miserable, maybe it's fine, but that's pretty steep. Um, according to this brand's website, most insurance companies do not cover it. So this would be like an out-of-pocket kind of situation. And I have no idea if the VA would would be cool with it. I kind of doubt it, but I'll give it a try in clinic sometime. Um, and really excitingly, um, I was I was curious if there was like a topical pilocarpine. And there's not, as far as I can tell, one that's widely available at least. Um, but there is a protocol that was just published this year um, that's going to look at pilocarpine carping drops in the tongue for dry mouth. So stay tuned. The summary is not a ton of things work, but we have a lot of options. Think about the, the mechanism of this dry mouth. Is it because they literally aren't producing saliva or because they have the sensation of dry mouth? And that can kind of guide you to what um, sort of class of, of meds you use. Questions or comments about dry mouth? Okay, air hunger is super quick. I'm only gonna be talking about management. Um, management of air hunger. We all use, at least I have, like in the, the comfort care order set, it's morphine, really. Um, benzodiazepines for like the anxiety associated with, with air hunger. Um, I'm curious if any of you have heard of or used nebulized furosemide. This was brand new for me. Why it works, I don't fully get, um, but it's been shown to be helpful for folks with COPD. Um, something about like, I'm not even gonna remember the word, sensitizing the, the receptors in the lungs, helping people feel less dyspneic, kind of strange. I'd be curious if it exists. I have not seen it used, but it has, it's been like, shown a few times. Um, there is, excuse my lack of a second parenthesis, um, dexamethasone was shown to be helpful in a 2016 randomized controlled trial, um, which I think is a pretty interesting option, partly because oftentimes when folks are really chronically dyspneic and maybe at the end of their life, they're also a bit drowsy and we're kind of like managing this like alertness with pain management and symptom management. It's often kind of a tug and pull. And this study also showed that like folks tend to be a, lit more, a bit more alert, unsurprisingly, when they're on dexamethasone. So it could be an interesting option. Have any of you used de de dexamethasone for? I haven't. See some head nods. Yeah, I've never used it. Um, and then lastly, mirtazapine might be helpful. Really tiny study really tiny study. Um, so here's my summary. Uh, for itching, what I want you to remember is that thinking about the mechanism can really help you think about treatment options. Um, for dry mouth, I want you to stay tuned for this OGT spray that is um, going to become more useful. Talk to your dentistry colleagues. They may have better access to it than you do. Um, and then for air hunger, think about steroids. I'm going to be thinking about steroids. Um, I don't know that we can like confidently say it should be first line for air hunger by any means. Morphine is still like far and away as well as a fan. Um, like both of those are very helpful, but steroids could be an interesting new option for you. Um, that is it. Thank you so much, everyone, for your engagement. Hopefully it was mildly helpful. If anyone is curious, 
Tinny appears, you and uh, you and Anna need to get together to talk about chronic symptom management because <gasps> I would she, love that. She uh, has some good knowledge. So Anna, thank you so much for an awesome talk that we put you on the spot for. Um, it's always fun to learn about medications I've never heard of. So um, how about we take a five minute break? 9.56 and Vicky is back and ready for action so we can put Vicky next. I'll say I did not stop itching through the whole talk. 